Welcome, 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 everyone. Uh, seeing in the chat already, we got people from all around the world tuning in, South America, Mexico, Texas, Florida, uh, Georgia. Very, very cool to have you all here. I am Dan Bovat, entrepreneur, and thanks for joining us for another installment of Ask Mark. And as always, we have Mr. Mark Randolph, who is the co-founder and founding CEO of Netflix, here live to answer your questions. As you guys know, Mark has mentored hundreds of early stage entrepreneurs. He hosts the That Will Never Work podcast, and he can be seen on the new season of our show, Entrepreneur Elevator Pitch, which you can find on entrepreneur.com, our YouTube, and all over the place. Long story short, you're going to want to listen to the, what this guy has to say. At least I think so. Mark, should they listen to what you have to say? Well, that's, I'll leave it as an optional, but okay. uh, I, hopefully I can say something intriguing. <laughs> I think so. Uh, if the past has taught us anything, uh, you've got some uh, really good advice to give. So we are so excited to have you. And as a lot of you are already using, we have the chat. Please send your questions in. We've got a bunch already in the can that we'll, we'll jump right into. But if you've got a question, just uh, pop it in there. Um, so, Mark, I, I have my own question. So, uh, as I mentioned, you are one of the investors on our show, Entrepreneur Elevator Pitch. So, I got to watch you in action. And uh, I guess I'd like to know, for, uh, some of the entrepreneurs were a little aggressive. Some of them were a little too, you seem to like when people are a little aggressive, but how aggressive is too aggressive? Well, that's a good question. It, 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 it's got a, what I'm trying to gauge um, is your personality. And it's not like I have some one size fits all definition of what an entrepreneur uh, personality should be. Uh, and you don't need to be um, aggressive. Uh, you can be very shy. You can be reticent. It's okay. I, I want to get a sense of who you are. And I've learned not to actually prejudge. I mean, just for an example, I work uh, with one entrepreneur. I'm actually mentoring him now in his, the second company. I've been working with him for more than a, for a dozen years. And when I first met him, you know, he's he's a little delicate. He speaks softly, you know, and and. I thought to myself when I first met this guy, I go, oh, my God, he is going to get eaten alive. And it is unbelievable how persistent and how strong this person is. It just doesn't come across when you meet him. So the answer is, uh, Dan, I don't really care. On the show, on Elevator Pitch, I this is TV. I mean, you've got basically 60 seconds. And so you do not need to be leaping out at, out of the screen, out of the television set at people, but use your opportunity and put some energy into it. Whether you're shy or not, you know, don't be asleep. <laughs> okay, good. Good advice. I hope everyone was listening to that. Uh, but let's, let's jump into some of the questions that we got. And the first one, I think this is a very common one. Uh, so Adu Brabi, uh, I want to apologize in advance for anyone's name that I'm not getting right. But uh, they want to know, how do you set up your own company with little or no startup capital? Uh, I assume by set up, you don't mean the legal setup. Um, I assume you mean getting started. Um, and actually, uh, it, you don't need um, startup capital to start your own business. And I think it's a mistake that a lot of people make. You know, they have this classic definition of, you know, the startups kind of looking for the repeatable, scalable business model. And so they think you have to start out the gate with something repeatable and scalable. And that's completely not true. And in fact, I think the opposite. I think you should start with things that are non-repeatable and non-scalable. Uh, you, do, you don't need to have an app. You don't need to have infrastructure. You don't need to have your own warehouses. You don't need to manufacture lots of products. Um, th hack it. Figure out ways to do things that are non-repeatable and non-scalable. Uh, do it by hand. Do it in ways that if you are successful, you'll get killed. But that's great. I mean, I, I've used the example before, but people say, okay, I, you know, I have this idea for an app. Now, how do I raise the money to hire the engineer? And how do I, and I'm going, don't, don't use an app, fake it, do it all behind the scenes. Um, 
I mean, there's a famous, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Amazon's um, had uh, this service called Mechanical Turk. And what Mechanical Turk was, was back in the, I guess it was the late 1800s, was basically this robot which miraculously could do all kinds of advanced calculations. But what it was really doing was it had people hiding inside it doing the calculations. And that's how you uh, start a company with no capital is on the outside, it looks like, oh my gosh, I have this incredible website which automatically figures out how to find out the cheapest flight and book a ticket and then it automatically sends email. But it's not doing any of that crap automatically. You're taking it all and you're sitting down longhand and doing all these things. You're sending the emails out. You're figuring out what the cheapest flights are. And you're right. If that hits, you'll get crushed. You can't keep doing that because it's so labor intensive and so slow. But it's a perfect way to find out whether your idea is any good. And I've said this before, but it bears saying yet one more time is the idea doesn't count. Uh, what's important is how clever you can be figuring out a quick, cheap, and easy way to try it. And the key to doing that is not building something repeatable, not building something scale. Now, I didn't answer your question directly, but I hope you figured out that what that does is allows you to start things and allows you to try things without having to raise money. You can do it all yourself. You can do it with a yellow pad. You can do it with three by five cards. You can do it with a telephone. Okay, and what, listen, we, we referred earlier to the fact I have a podcast. Episode one was a woman who had this great idea. She wanted to do the Airbnb for home, pardon me, the Uber for home health care. You know, she was going to match up caregivers with people who needed care. And same problem. How do I build an app? How do I hire it? Where do I get an engineer? This is it all expensive? How do I raise money? And I go, you don't even know if it works yet. Do, fake it. Find some people who need health care. Find some healthcare workers, and then when someone says, hey, I need someone, then you get in the phone and find them. That's going to cost you nothing. You can do it in your spare time with a cell phone. Anyway, I'm belaboring the point. But God, I, if the single biggest excuse I hear all the time is I can't start because number one on the list is I don't have any money. Number two on the list is I've got to, I don't want to quit my day job or whatever it is. And you don't need to do any of that stuff. If you have an idea, for God's sake, start it and just figure out some way to do it quickly, cheaply, and easily. So I didn't mean to turn this into a rant, but it's such an important point, Dan. No, that's that's great. And you're getting a lot of a lot of amens in the chats. People are uh, really <laughs> digging that. So so that's great. Um you know speaking of ideas, this was sort this is an interesting question from uh, Sylvester Johns, who's wondering about is there a business model that you really like that he can reverse engineer an idea from, you know, start with what the business model is and then think of an idea that matches that. Yeah, that is a really, I, yeah. by the way, people watching earlier, we said we were talking before we went alive about how uh, the question, how I usually can come up with an answer pretty quickly to a question. And so I think Dan is in there picking ones that I actually have to think for a while but before I know what the answer is. This is a good one because I really don't, off the top of my head, know something how I would do that. Uh, and Vesta, you might have stumped Mark no, Randolph. I'm not oh. stumped, Dan. <laughs> I'm just saying <laughs> it, might, it might take me a little bit. No, and the only reason I'm a little stumped is I don't necessarily I don't usually do it that way where I take a business model and then reverse engineer it. Um, I usually start from what's the problem and then I figure out some interest, try and find some interesting new way uh, to solve it. But I do like that approach. I mean, you can certainly. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember what's uh, we, you know I I have a we have an entrepreneurial discord that a bunch of us are on and. Today, someone was talking about his model is basically study and improve. And he had some catchy name for it, where he gets a product, really takes it all apart, and then thinks, what can I, how can I tweak this to make it a little bit better? And that's kind mm -hmm. of what I think you're you're talking about doing. But I'll listen, I'll, I'll, I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be all proud here. I'll say I'm stumped. I I have no <laughs> idea. That's a good question. All right, Sylvester, you get a I don't know, does he get a gold, a, gold star? A, a gold star. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so here's, I think, a, a, a problem that a lot of people have. Um, 
in a, any kind of business that they're doing. This is from Gianni Solis, who says, how do I find customers outside of my sphere of friends, family, and local acquaintances? You know, I think anyone who creates anything, whether it's they wrote a book or they're selling something, they blast it out on other social media, but then like, now what? Yeah, it's a it, it, it is interesting thing because you do want to start, of course, with friends and family and local acquaintances because they're easy. But eventually, you do have to expand um, expand beyond that. And this is the the nut of what uh, good marketing is is figuring out who is the ideal customer and how do I uh, how do I communicate to them. And we are incredibly lucky that the internet and social media both have made it very, very easy to find clusters of people who may be your ideal um, customer. And I, I can't tell you specifically how to find them because I don't know what your certain your customer set needs to be. But I do know that that's a very, very valid way to do it. And let me give you a perfect example. And this is one from Netflix that goes back 20 plus 25 years. You know, at the very beginning, we had this fundamental problem, which Netflix was a DVD by mail company, you know, DVDs, the discs. But there was very, very few ways to reach and find DVD owners because there just weren't that many of them. And you couldn't advertise. You would waste your money. And so what we did was we said there are places where these audio visual geeks who are the first early adopters of DVD players cluster. And we hired a person whose job was to linger in all of these user groups and basically spread the word. And that was the old fashioned way to do it. And it was very, very effective for us because it positioned us as, you know, this place where back when this was a brand new medium that people could go and get pretty much any movie they wanted on DVD, which was impossible back then. And we did that by finding these clusters of people who were potential customers and going where they are. And I would say that's the same thing you have to do is you certainly can join those areas on the net and in social media where people who are your potential customers are clustering. You can find ways to speak to them. For example, if there is a publication, for example, or a blog, if there is a very, very popular channel, you can certainly go to that person and say, I'd like to write something for you. I'd like to be on your podcast. I would like to, you know, you can figure out a way to get yourself in front of those people. But you're going to have to work at it. I mean, you're going to have to be clever about it and you're going to have to be persistent. Because, for example, if you do want a guest post on a popular website that's dealing with the type of people you're trying to sell to, you may have to approach a handful of them or more before you, someone agrees to actually do it. But um, that's all it is. It's knowing who your customer is, knowing where they hang out, and then going to meet them where they are. Uh, that's that's great. And, um, you know, uh, in the world out there, we've got competition. And this, this question came in from uh, Fitness Boy. Uh, and this is about how to keep, not me, uh, that's not my pen name, but um, <laughs> so, <laughs> How do you keep up with your competition? Uh, and I, I think the bigger question here is when you see competition, are you chasing competition? Oh, they're doing something better than me. Do you immediately pivot to do that too? Do you stick to your guns? How do you approach that? Yeah, competition. Um, a lot of it has to do with whether you're in first place or you're not in first place. Uh, but, and this is going to sound, uh, a little crazy is I usually don't spend a lot of time worrying about what the competition is doing. I mean, they are competition, so don't get me wrong. I try and understand everything they're doing, but I almost never will base, I'll never do a quick reaction based on what they're doing. For me, it's much more strategic. I mean, I'm really trying to understand who are they? Who are they serving? What product do they have? What is their vulnerability? What can I do that they won't be able to respond to? Uh, but once I've found that crack that I'm going to try and exploit, uh, I, I go head down and just keep on executing. 
because fundamentally that that's the most important thing you can do is keep on executing, keep on doing. I certainly wouldn't keep pivoting back and forth. Um, I mean, it's one thing, you know, you're doing something and all of a sudden your competition is bigger than you does the exact same thing. Yes, of course you have to respond. But if you figured out how it is you actually can beat them, that you serve a different segment than they do, that you're going to go after this niche, that you have some advantage in price, or you have some advantage in speed, or you have some advantage in service, you've just got to keep doubling down on that and trust that your judgment about what it was that was going to differentiate you positively is going to pay off. Um, obviously, there's no one-size-fits-all answer here because it's always going to be different. But as I go back and think about the competition that have been coming after, either coming after companies I've been working on or where I'm going after someone, very rarely do I respond once I've set a course. That's great. Uh, I, I love that. And I think, I think that uh, maybe give, give everyone a little, you could relax a little and, and do maybe not relax isn't the right word, but you can, you can be confident in yourself and not be worrying about outside forces. I think that's, that's amazing advice. Um, and, but, it's and, all, and it's, it's all execution. It's all execution. It's all about being able to, if you know, you keep, you pick something, you just keep going and going and going on that path. And eventually, eventually it works most of the time, especially a bigger competitor, they can't move as quickly as you. Um, and you have to trust that that is an incredibly, um, powerful thing. And if someone's nibbling, it, if you're bigger and someone's nibbling at your edges, fine. Uh, you can't defend every single flank. So you recognize this is my core. Um, and I'm going to keep serving my core. And as long as I keep serving my core, um, I'm invulnerable. You can nibble at the edges all you want. You'll never take the business away from me. It kind of, they, they both, it's that focus is a very, very powerful thing. I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt you though, Dan. No, no, no. Uh, what you said was much uh, smarter and more eloquent than what I was going to say. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for saving me. Um, uh, no, that, that, that single mind. Of, and you know, we see it in elevator pitch. You, you really love when someone is just all in on one idea. They don't have 20 spinoffs. They're, they're doing their one thing. So I think that's great. Um, we have a question from uh, Maya Amaway, um, and we've talked about this before, and she's wondering about managing mental health while running a company. Uh, as everyone knows, extremely stressful, especially when it's your thing and it's it's all on you. Uh, you have talked about this before, but wondering, you know, if you could give some further insights on on managing your mental health and knowing when to take a break or, or do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself. Yeah, it's a really, really important uh, subject. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, we actually did a great podcast episode uh, maybe six months ago uh, entirely on mental health because it isn't, it's not talked about. And the reality is running a startup is remarkably stressful you are thinking about it all the time. You're worrying about it um, all the time. It can be very depressing when things aren't going well. It can be very lonely uh, because a lot of times you feel like there is no one that you can, um, you can talk to about it. And it is really, really easy to let yourself um, get to a point where you're not just compromising your company's health, you're compromising your own, you're compromising your relationships, you're compromising all kinds of things. So, but I also know that it's very uh, trite to say, uh, so just, just chill, because I know that's really uh, not helpful advice. You have a lot of pressure, people are counting on you. Um, I have maybe two things that I've always kind of relied on um, that all kind of fit in that same category of recognizing that this is, you know, a uh, not a sprint to use a stupid analogy, but it's, it is a marathon. Um, I've got a weird analogy. I don't think I've used like this before, but I, I, I for a long time, I did triathlons. Um, and I think they've changed it now, but for a long time, when you did a triathlon, the first e e part event of the three is the swimming. 
And so you line up five or 600 people on the beach and you say, go. And five or 600 people all charge into the water at the exact same time. And it is a complete shit show. You know, people are kicking and flailing and they're on top of each other and people are knocking your goggles off. And it's like the most terrifying thing in the world. And so what I realized, what you have to do is you have to jump in the water and from that get go, sprint as hard as you can for the first, uh, you know, five minutes. Now, that is not a strategy to use for a race, which could be three, six, 10 hours. Uh, but if you can sprint for those first five or six minutes, it allows you to get out ahead of the pack and then you can relax and go, okay, now I'm going to settle into a pace that I can maintain for the rest of the hour of the swim. Now, I tell you that analogy because I hope you're picking up where I'm going with this is that some ways startups are like that. There are periods of intensity that you cannot avoid but not all the time. And so what you have to recognize is I've gotten to a point where I can breathe. And for God's sake, breathe. Don't say, oh my gosh, I have some space. I'm now going to get a 20,000 things done because then when the next burnout period comes, you're in no position to handle it. So number one is, gosh, pace yourself. Don't be lazy all the time. But when you have the opportunity, slow down a bit, let your team recover. Let yourself recover. Uh, the second other insight I would share with you that, that I've used to kind of um, guard my own um, mental health, and I've written about this, is this realization that not everything is critical. In fact, most things are not critical. That if you're staying up until two in the morning, reviewing someone's work or you're p polishing a presentation or you're checking your fonts and you're, do you're, doing, you're doing all this extra work for these little incremental things because you believe I've got to get everything right, you are going to kill yourself, really. It's just too much. And the reality is, as I've said, you don't lose that deal by not correcting the fonts on the presentation at two in the morning. You lost the deal two or three weeks ago by not being adequately prepared or not having the right price or the right product or the right offer. So don't hustle everything. Recognize that not everything has to be perfect. In fact, most things don't have to be perfect. So learn to recognize the things you do have to get right and all the rest of it, let it slide a little bit. Again, this is a long, long haul. And then the last one, and this certainly has worked for me, is I recognized I was going to have to make sure I prioritized things other than the business, that I had a family, I had a wife, you know, that I wanted to make sure I was there for. And I have the misfortune of having my life passion be this outdoor stuff, which requires me to have hours, days, and weeks free to do it. Um, and I could not have any of that stuff if I didn't make it a priority and plan appropriately for it. So. Again, this is a, a topic we could talk about for multiple um, of these shows, Dan. But, you know, the biggest advice I can say is don't let this burn you out. Um, you're in it for the long haul. Uh, it's not just this first startup you're doing. Um, it's your second and your third and your fourth. And if you want to make a career out of it, you have to figure out these strategies that allow you to keep your stress levels down, allow you to maintain your connections with your family and your wife and your children, your friends. And most importantly, you've got to make sure you keep yourself healthy. Uh, that's that's amazing. That's that's great stuff. Getting a lot of a lot of love in the chat here from that. Uh, so people really appreciate it. And they also want to know they appreciate your insight so much. And they want to know why, Mark, why do you care so much about us? Why do you care about startups? You could kind of just <laughs> go live on a. a on a mountaintop and uh you know mountain climb and do everything you want to do why why are you what's the passion for you here how do i answer this one um there's two pieces to it uh one is you know i i've had a hand in doing seven startups and they are intense um and I can't turn that off. I see a problem and I have to solve it. It's like walking down the street and seeing a box with puppies in it. And you go, what? You can't just leave this puppy here. Some, someone's got to do something. That's me when I see a business problem. I've got to solve it. Um, 
but I don't want to keep doing it as a founder anymore. It's too much of a burnout. So I need this. Uh, I need to get my fix in a much more uh, measured way. And the way I've found it is not starting my own company, but helping other people start theirs. Because if I pick the right companies to help, I get to sit down at the table with them. I get to work with these really smart, fun people. I get to solve really cool puzzles. And then I get to go home at the end of the night. So this mentoring stuff that I do, I'll, I will confess, since we're among friends here, it's not entirely altruistic. It's feeding this need that I have to be engaged in the startup world, but not be thinking about it seven by 24. So that, that's this basic reason that I do what I do. Um, there's another one, and this is kind of getting a little more uh, touchy-feely, but I kind of had this insight um, quite a number of years ago that all this stuff that I've learned over the 40 years that I've been an entrepreneur, all these things that I've learned about how to take this idea and turn it into a reality are, are the exact same steps and the exact same processes that anybody can use to take any crazy idea they have and try and turn it into a reality. And that once I'd cracked that code, I had to share that with people. Um, I had to help other people take their crazy ideas and try and at least give them a shot. Um, and now I got to say that's kind of my life's work, I suppose, is to uh, is how do I do that? And that was why I wrote the book. That's why I wrote that one over work. It's why I do the podcast. It's why I, you know, write a blog. It's why I'm doing this. Uh, all different ways of trying to tell people who are all of us have ideas. Everyone, as, as my, you know, my... Um, my friend Nolan Bushnell says, anyone who's had a shower has had an idea. But we all want to try and make them real. And I know something about that. And it's my obligation to teach people if I can, along with you. And thank you to Entrepreneur for all you do to help with that, too. No, that's that's great. That's amazing. Uh, well, we, we certainly appreciate it. We appreciate your time. We're coming up on uh, on the end here. Um, we, oh, can, can I add one thing, Dan, to that? Yeah. I'm sorry. I do get a chance to hang out in the top of mountaintops. So don't feel, don't feel overly sorry for me. Uh, I've, got, I've, I've got a pretty cushy life uh, on the side. So uh, All right, quick, I'm, doing, quick, I'm, do, quick, I'm doing both. <laughs> quick, quick side question. Uh, when's the last time you were hanging off of something and thought to yourself, why am I doing this? I could be sitting oh. in a really nice house and not risking my life right now. Oh, God, it's the opposite, Dan. It's like you, you're sitting in a comfortable house and you're going, God, why aren't I out like um, hanging off a cliff someplace? <laughs> Seriously. That's, that, that's, what makes you alive. that's what makes you alive, man. I look for so awesome. every opportunity I have. Um, so we've gotten a couple of questions here. I think I'll, I'll sort of, uh, I'll kind of lump them into one, which is, you know, just getting, getting it from here and get going like, Give everyone some homework. What's a step one to get a team together to to make that first step where you feel like, okay, this is real. I'm doing something. Okay, and actually, I'm just kind of looking sideways here at the comments. And there's a someone says, um, I'm really struggling with this about not knowing how to build a team and initiate work. And I can weave those two together, which is that's the first step that people have to take. If you have an idea, you do not need to build a team. You do not need to initiate work. You know, the first thing you do is immediately try and figure out some quick way to validate whether your idea is a good one or not. Uh, the, uh, most of the time, almost all the time, the idea you have, that wonderful idea, it's not original. Someone's already doing it. All the rest of the times, it's a bad idea. But it is fine. That is how it works. What you have to do is just stop thinking about it and take the idea and take some first step, you know, to build something or make something or test something or try something. And remember, in a non-repeatable, non-scalable way, down and dirty, cheap and fast, something, some way you can figure out how to collide your idea with a real customer as quickly as you can. Because that's when you're going to learn, oh, shit, someone's already doing this. Or, damn doesn't work. And it's fine. That's the process that every single entrepreneur in the world goes through. 
Every single person you know who's successful got things wrong 99% of the time. They just had the persistence that finally found that one time where it actually worked. So you've got to start. Stop dreaming. Stop thinking about this big, complicated process. Start wait. Stop waiting until you have raised money or built a team or with you've thought it through and you've studied the business plan and forget all that crap. It's a, it's wasted. Today, figure out something you can do that allows you to collide your idea with a real customer. Um, and I have a million. You know, it's it's the way an entrepreneur thinks. It's the way you've got to train yourself to think if you want to take these ideas and make them real. Start doing something today. And you can do it today without raising money or writing a line of code by being clever and figuring out how can I hack a way to collide this idea with a real customer. And believe me, you do that for six months and all of a sudden you begin gaining this knowledge and something's working and you're doing it all on yellow pads and three by five cards. And one of your little engineer friends looks over your shoulders and go, what are you doing? And you explain how you have this incredible passion now from these customers and you're doing it all manually. I promise they go, well, that's crazy. You could, you could try this. You could, and then pretty soon he's going, we could do this. We could do that. And lo and behold, you've got a team. And now someone hears about it and goes, why aren't you going faster? And we have no money. Well, shit, I can give you, that looks an amazing idea. That comes second. It all starts with colliding that idea with reality. So get to it. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Wow. I'm fired up. I think uh, everyone in this chat who's watching should be fired up too. You've got some homework, people. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for for your insights. Again, you're so generous with your time and, and everything you know. And for anyone who wants to hear more from Mark, please go to his website, markrandolph.com. Listen to his website, that, I mean, his podcast that will never work and watch him on Entrepreneur Elevator Pitch, which you can see on entrepreneur.com. Mark, thank you so much. Any parting words? Any uh, sign off? Do we have a signature Mark Randolph sign off yet? No, I've got to work on something clever. Uh, I, that's my assignment. I got to come up with the theme music for the opening and then I'll have a clever, catchy a sign off. But for now, I'll say thanks, Dan. Thanks to everyone from Entrepreneur Magazine. And thanks to all of you guys for showing up and uh, throwing such good questions at me. Sorry I couldn't get to more. But hey, I'll be back again next month. Excellent. With a song and a <laughs> sign off. Well, All right, everyone. Thanks so much. We'll see you again thanks, next man. time. See y'all next time.